Okay, so we start with our first panel, which is by far the largest. <laughs> it's a kind of uh, Brady Bunch of uh, African pavilions. Um, but I think African, Africa dies poor pavilions, I should say. But uh, really the kind of, the aim is to frame the beginning of this panel with some historical context. Uh, so Ricky Jorgensen, who runs Arts and Globalization, um, is going to kind of lead with a historical overview of um, the Biennale's history. Um, she's going to talk about how Venice from pretty much 1922 onwards um, had sort of African pavilions present, um, but really a discussion about the challenges around this expansion and representation of creative practices in Africa that have been represented here in Venice. Uh, the panel will explore opportunities for creative solutions that have been identified throughout the years. Um, so there have been lots of stop and starts uh, when it comes to the story of Africa in Venice, and I hope what the panel can kind of speak to after uh, Ricky's historical presentation or overview is really the kind of nature of what it means, what are the kind of pragmatic solutions involved in 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 being part of a a, a, a national event like uh, the Venice Biennale, um, and I think we'll introduce you all. Actually, maybe it's better to do it now. So um, uh, I can't do it in order because you're all a different order in this. Uh, <laughs> again, big bunch. But um, but uh, Joel Adriana Morosa um, is an artist. He's representing the Madagascar Pavilion this year. Uh, you have Emmanuel Dade, uh, curator of the Mescal, Madagascar Pavilion, Martin Kennedy, curator of the Seychelles Pavilion. Nkul Mbasso, curator of the South Africa Pavilion. Nambusa Makubu, uh, curator of the South Africa, co-curator of the South African Pavilion. You have uh, Rina Raleigh Hanevo, uh, curator of the Madagascar, co curator of the Madagascar Pavilion. Uh, uh, Massimo Scaringella, curator of the Ivory Coast Pavilion. And finally, Amin Amina Zubir, um, artist uh, representing the Algerian Pavilion. So I think um, that's it. And we'll start with Ricky, and then we're going to go into a more general panel. Thank you, Jose, and I um, just want to say that it's a huge privilege and I'm extremely humble and thankful for this invitation to, and to be with this amazing panel today. Together we are writing art history right now, so I'm very humble and, and thankful. So, I started Arts and Globalization platform uh, in 2015 and Jose was actually part of it. Uh, he was one of the speakers and I also invited Okwe in Indvesar, but he was of course busy doing uh, the biannual. But um, instead I invited Okwe and, uh, uh, sorry, Jose and um, Ibrahim Mahama uh, as speakers. So um, everything is connected for me and, and my attempt to do arts and globalization platform was actually uh, seeing that there was a need uh, in where I am located, which is Denmark, uh, Copenhagen, uh, to, to um, expand the, the local art scene with a more uh, global discussion. So that was what I tried after having lived in Paris and Barcelona and different places in, in Europe. Uh, I came back and I, I wanted to really make an impact on my local art scene. Uh, so I started uh, to do a conference, Arts and Globalization, and uh, this is why I'm here today. I have had this uh, wonderful job to give a short overview of the African uh, participation in, Ven in the Venice bi Biennial since uh, 2022. So I will start very uh, fast uh, and actually just say that the Venice Biennial was of course created on April uh, 1893. Um, where the city council passed a resolution to set up a biennial exhibition of Italian art uh, to celebrate the silver anniversary of King Umberto I and Margarita of uh, Savoy. And a year later, the council decreed to adopt uh, a by invitation system to reserve a section of the by, uh, exhibition to foreign artists too. Uh, to admit works by uninvited Italian artists uh, selected by the jury. And the first biennial um, was opened on April 30, 1895 by the Italian king and queen um, and was seen by 224 visitors. 
So this is just uh, to go back in time, and then uh, I will jump to 1922. Um, uh, I have a few facts, actually, about the uh, biannual system. So I, I don't want to talk much about this because it has not anything to do with African representation, but it's just interesting to have some kind of idea about how the biannual uh, concept started and, and how it has expanded in an extremely fast pace uh, the, the last, uh, the, the recent years. But back to 1922, the curators Antti and Mochi curated um, an, an African exhibition inside the Central Pavilion. Um, both of them were anthropologists and, the work, and their work uh, came from ethnographic collections in Rome and Florence. I'm just running this very shortly because it's part of my research and I think actually open research is the way to go when it's about uh, African representation uh, at the Venice Biennial and uh, the meaning of the Biennial as a platform that creates uh, constant uh, discussion on contemporary issues. In 1958, uh, Tunisia presented a pavilion at the Venice Biennial for the first time. Um, and in 1990, uh, there was some exhibition, exhibitions like the Studio Museum of Harlem that showed five artists from Africa at the Venice Biennale. Uh, the general response uh, was, yeah, not so great um, at this time. Um, but there was select, they selected a strong, um, group of artists, um, and it was yeah one of the first uh, con attempts to really do something uh, contemporary, uh, representing African artists here. In 1993, uh, the year later, uh, Susan Fogel, the director of uh, the newly inaugurated Museum for African Art in New York, shows five artists from Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire at Venice uh, in, in, at the Venice Biennial. And in 2001, we have, of course, the, I'm just running this at the same time because uh, we, now we are coming up to, uh, to, to, today, to today. In 2001, Salah Hassan and Ulu Guibe uh, co-curated the exhibition Authentic Eccentric Africa in and out of Africa um, as a part of the 49th Venice Biennial. And uh, this exhibition featured the work of seven prominent contemporary African uh, and African diaspora artists. Um, so, um, yeah, that was like maybe one of the first uh, unofficial pavilions, you can say. Um, but the, real, the, the pavilion that was presented as the, as the first African pavilion was uh, in 2007, where Simon Jami and uh, Fernando Alvin uh, created, um, yeah, what the, uh, the 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 pavilion in, in Angola, the Angola, Angola pavilion, sorry, uh, of contemporary art. Uh, so it was called Checklist Luanda Pop Show. Um, and this was actually uh, at the 52nd Venice Biennial, um, and the press release promoted it like this. For the first time in its official program, the 52nd Venice Biennial um, International Contemporary Art Exhibition uh, is presenting an African pavilion. Checklist Wanda Pop consecrate, consecrated 30 artists from the uh, Syndica Tokolo collection uh, to, this, to this exhibition. And there's been some controversy because um, the, this, uh, this foundation uh, who, who supported the works, uh, supported the exhibition with works, uh, yeah, had some activities uh, of a Congolese businessman and art collector uh, that was not very clear. So there was a controversy about where the money came from, uh, but also the pavil pavilion was later criticized for wanting to represent the whole continent of Africa in 40, uh, 54 countries in just one pavilion. So that was not uh, well seen from, from, uh, from the critics of, of this uh, first pavilion. But in any case, these were the names of, uh, of the, two, uh, for the Angola Pavilion and this, uh, the, the checklist exhibition. Uh, 
just for you to see who was ex exhibited. And here are some pictures from, from the, from the uh, inauguration. So this is, yes? It was, it was just to add to that chronology, 2003, Jelaine Torajos did uh, Fault Lines. Yes. And that was about an exhibition about Africa and African diaspora. Thank you so much, because you know, I need all these inputs, because this is a, a, a work in progress for me as well. So, so thank you very much. And uh, I think we are all actually um, doing research, because there's a, been a lot of things happening, officially and unofficially, because also in... Uh, I think it was in 19. Um, it was in in, in um, actually in 1999. There was a man, uh, George Adiagbo, who was doing an unofficial um, display, a parallel exhibition, held during the 48th uh, biannual, and he was uh, he was exhibiting found objects, images, and texts on the street. Uh, and also outside of the uh, Arsenale. And um, yeah, it was an exhibition between artwork and exhibition in a way. So, um, so he was, and it was called Story of the Lion. And this, you can find a really beautiful video uh, from, from his work. Um, so there's many things and many interventions during these years uh, th that the Venice Biennial has existed. And it's, a, it's actually a work in progress to even research it, because many things has, uh, have not been uh, written down, and, and many things are like uh, small notes uh, that you find uh, in archives and in, on the internet. So there's a research work to be done, but I'm happy to see that some of the researchers that are working on this subject are actually present today. So maybe in the lounge we can talk more. So I'll just shortly uh, sum up uh, and by jumping up to 2015, Okwe Invesa's fantastic uh, biannual. He was elected um, to become the first African curator, they, they say in the press releases. Uh, and um, his title was All the World's Futures. This was for me the turning point and the point of no return of this story of African representation at the Venice Biennial. Okwe was uh, my inspiration for doing arts and globalization. I also invited him uh, as a speaker, but we, uh, we worked very hard at the same time in 2015, so he just sent his support. And um, yeah, this was uh, the, the main exhibition uh, at the Arsenale. And here we have Okwe that I'm deeply thankful for because he was a huge, huge inspiration and uh, one of the greatest curators uh, in terms of opening up, uh, opening up the art history that I that I have actually seen. But the story will continue, and we are now up in 2017, where um, eight African countries presented national pavilions in, in 2017, and that was Angola, Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, Nigeria, that has had their first pavilion, South Africa, Tunisia, Zimbabwe, and uh, Kenya. And then um, in 2019, where we are now, Hopefully uh, and fortunately, we have the representatives sitting here next to me, so I don't have to give any overview. I will just let uh, the, the, the real contemporary uh, present moment speak for itself. Um, and uh, yeah, just mentioned that Ghana has its first pavilion and uh, Madagascar has its first pavilion. And we have uh, representatives uh, for, from uh, at least one of them. Uh, pavilions here today. So thank you very much and I'm looking forward to talk to you all and also I would just say that African representation in Venice for me is about the relationship between Europe and Africa and this is a very important relationship for both parts. So we are both um, in this relationship committed and, and working hard to, to go forward and into the future together. Thank you. So thank you so much. I mean, speaking of points of no return, um, it's in fact paradoxical because while all the world's futures, I guess, kind of staged the most sort of global and ambitious iteration of Venice that tried to at least frame the complexity of a kind of post-colonial 
question. Um, it is, in fact, the case that so many African pavilions have, have come and gone in relation to the Biennale, and actually it's very much uh, a, a point of contest contention as to what the value is of a pavilion. So I really want to open up this for all of the wonderful speakers here to really start with their pavilions. I mean, if we go from the top, sort of, I guess the question of why Venice, I think, needs to be the first one, but also maybe you could elaborate on the title of your pavilions and where they're situated for anyone here that is uh, interested in visiting. Thank you, Asse. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Kennedy. I'm curating the Republic of the Seychelles Pavilion. And we have two artists uh, creating work this year, uh, George Camille, Daniel Dodin. Why are we here? Well, we are a very, very small country. We're a small island nation of fewer than 100,000 people. We would all fit into a large football stadium. It's always been a danger that the work that develops in the Seychelles ends up being less authentic as a unique African voice. Um, it was mentioned earlier, how do we want Africa to be? Africa, in my view, and I've lived in Seychelles for 22 years, needs to be itself. It needs to be authentic. And it has a multitude of voices. Our voice, we feel, or the artists of Seychelles feel, needs to be at Venice because it gives a different voice, a different kind of voice with a different kind of audience. It enables us to be part of a truly international dialogue. And I agree with the last speaker. I think you're absolutely right. This is about the relationship between Europe and Africa. I think in Seychelles, we also have to mitigate some of the negative effects of our bread and butter industry, which is tourism. The role of tourism across Africa varies from one nation to another. But it's a sobering thought to realize that of the multi-billion dollar tourism industry, which is certainly set to increase over the next period of time, about 4% comes to Africa, 4%. If you compare that with revenues in Europe, Asia, the United States, it's a very, very small amount. Nevertheless, in Seychelles, we rely very greatly on tourism to keep our economy afloat. And therefore, we find that in many cases, artists' work, artists' productivity and output is, if I may use the word, compromised by the need to sell to tourists. Uh, we put a book out two years ago called uh, Art in Seychelles Then and Now. And the research for that book involved meetings with pretty much everyone making contemporary art in Seychelles. I pitched the questions differently to each person according to their work and their practice and their vision. But one question I asked everybody, how does the fact that tourists dominate the purchasing market in Seychelles influence your work? And without exception, every artist said, well, you know what? I have to subsidize the work that I truly want to do from my heart by making work that I know will sell. We do have a small and growing group of Seychellois collectors who are serious about having art and supporting art. But still, the lion's share of work is sold to tourists who then take it away with them at the end of their holiday. And so we have this dilemma. Just as in the States or in Europe or other countries, an artist will very typically teach in order to support her or his uh, if you like, uh, more authentic personal work. In Seychelles, we find a different balance where an artist is likely to produce one set of work to sell in order to support not only food on the table, but the production of another set of work, which has a greater personal investment and authenticity. Now, it's this second kind of work that we, and by we, I mean national and private sector NGOs in Seychelles, are seeking to promote. In 2017, we were not only here in Venice, we were here in 2015 as well, by the way, that was the first time. But we also had a regenerated Seychelles Biennale. And at that Biennale, every exhibiting artist was working in some form of installation mode. This would have been unthinkable even five or six years ago. 
And we feel that that's due to not only a greater connectivity globally through the internet, obviously, but also because of the efforts of the private sector, NGOs, and also government, uh, where there is encouragement and there is funding to promote a diversity of approach to making art that addresses important issues for the artist and important global issues. I'll stop now, but just to say that we were very happy. I came over in October, as I'm sure many of you did, and heard um, Mr. Rugoff, the, uh, the overall curator for the Venice Biennale, speak about the theme, May You Live in Interesting Times. And it very much connected, even though we are small and remote, with a reality in Seychelles. How do we discriminate? How do we uh, identify authentic information? How do we break out of our individual knowledge silos, which are often portrayed as a kind of right-wing thing, but I think they're everywhere. They're on the left, they're in the middle, they're everywhere. And we all have to be wary of the fact that we are quite capable of digging our own silo and only allowing data and information in, which reinforces our current position. Which is, of course, the opposite to the old age of enlightenment approach, which was, hey, look, this is what I think, knock it down. This is what I think, challenge me, give me something different to consider. That seems to be less prevalent today than perhaps at any other time that I can remember. So I think that engaging with the theme, engaging with Venice, the artists that we have here have done both of those things, and they are an important channel, an important artery of connectivity between... Venice, European perspectives, international global perspectives, and the very specific, unique African perspectives that we experience every day in Seychelles. Well, I think in relation to those African perspectives, it's good yeah, to hear across the panel. I think it's, it's also really important that you all sort of out, outline you know, what your pavilions are about, because I think in many cases, some of you here have a short amount of time to see things, and you're kind of eager to know where things are and you know what's going on. I'd also highlight that in relation to Ralph Rogoff's theme, um, some of you might like to elaborate on these in, in further dialogues, sort of the more specific ideas related to um, you know why you've chosen a specific theme or um, concept. Uh, we are at the Palazzo Mora, by the way, <laughs> just to plug that, and we have an opening that you're all very warmly invited to on Friday at 4 p.m. Thank you, Martin. Okay. <coughs> Um, I am Massimo Scaringella, curator of Ivory Coast, but sorry, I speak in Italian. Da <laughs> um, circa tre edizioni, la Costa d'Avorio partecipa alla Biennale di Venezia perché il governo pensa che sia un'ottima promozione per <coughs> la scena culturale <coughs> del loro paese. Certamente tutto questo avviene in un contesto economico molto difficile e quindi è proprio questo impulso che cerca di dare il governo ivoriano per la diffusione della cultura ivoriana nel mondo che fa superare le difficoltà economiche ma che certamente sono molto forti. E, la scena culturale e artistica del paese è molto attiva anche se siamo anche lì in presenza di una diaspora la maggior parte degli artisti vanno o negli Stati Uniti o in Europa per cercare un, un tipo di contatto, una diffusione più forte rispetto a quello che potrebbe dare la permanenza nel paese, ma eh, la presenza di alcune buone gallerie e con eh, varie presenze nelle fiere internazionali e di operatori che cercano di, di, di far eh, uscire fuori questa questa, questi ottimi artisti stanno aiutando molto eh, la la presenza della, della costa d'avorio degli artisti ivoriani nel, nello scenario internazionale. E nel nostro padiglione sono presenti quattro artisti, Ernest Ducou, eh, Ananias Lekidago, eh, Valérie Oka e Jan, Jan Ruran, che è un artista cinese ma che ha pre presentato e eh, fatto un progetto nel, nel, nel corso del tempo in Costa d'Avorio 
e tutti e tre lavorano nell'ambito del, della memoria e di come la memoria del, della loro esperienza eh, in Africa venga poi tradotta nell'esperienza eh, visiva di quello che loro producono. E, Ananas Lekidako è un fotografo, Ernest Ducou è mh, un artista eh, pittore e Valerio Ka è una performer che cerca eh, di portare avanti il discorso della presenza della donna nell'arte africana che è ancora uno dei temi che è rimasto indietro rispetto alle dinamiche dell'arte attuale. Ecco questo è tutto. Grazie mille. So I think that on that note again to try really to be precise about what it is that your pavilion represents. <laughs> Joel and Rina, if you could, I think you're going to help each other out. Okay. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rina Raleranaivo. I'm co-curator of Madagascar Pavilion. And uh, to the question, why Venice? Because we deserve it. And I, I will let my, my friend and my artist, Joel Masu to to take to, to 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 give you first his impression because this pavilion exists because we have Joel. So I let him to to start. Hello everybody. Uh, good morning. Thank you for this invitation. Um, why Venice? And why not Venice? I think it's just uh, why not? We can be everywhere, and I think it's also important to be in Venice. There is, a, there is one point that I just want to, to point, actually. Everybody is saying that um, Madagascar is coming to Venice for the first time, but I think it's also important to say that Venice is receiving Madagascar for the first time also. It's quite important, I think, uh, because there was a kind of a long history that you were telling us about, you know, Africa was coming to Venice and everything. So I think we can also say something that they have to be proud to have us here. Uh, the Madagascar project, the Madagascar Pavilion is, uh, well, it's a project from my heart, from my country, actually, and from my head and everything. I'm not going to talk about the piece because the piece is now in Venice. It's already open since like uh, 45 minutes, so you all can go to the Arsenale. It's something related to Madagascar in terms of uh, emotion, in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of feelings, in terms of, how can I say that? Yeah, let's say emotion, but the piece is talking to the word. And this is, for me, this is the process, and this is one of the most important statements of this project, that Madagascar is not talking to Madagascar only, Madagascar is not talking only to Africa, even if we are in an African forum. Madagascar is talking to the world, and the world is, the world is talking to Madagascar. And I think we all agree on this table that uh, we, d we can't separate uh, just like uh, Africa, the continent, or our country, you know, that uh, we are like different. I think we are just, it's not the globalization thing. We are just like, yeah, we are on the same boat, we are on this, in the same world, and we are just like, uh, yeah, we are trying to do the same thing. And my real statement is, I'm an artist, of course, I'm carrying this, uh, this Madagascar panel, but as an artist, I think I can do many things. I can be everywhere. I can be sad and can be happy sometimes. I can laugh and I will die one day also. So come to the Madagascar Pavilion. <laughs> And then right after that, come to the South African Pavilion. <laughs> and, and we are neighbors. Right, so. we are both in the Arsenal, so you're already in the region. And uh, we have our opening at 5 uh, p.m. tomorrow. And then Namusa will give us the contutorial uh, statement of our pavilion. Sure. I think it's important to also note that with South Africa, we had participated um, I think in the, in the 70s, I'm not sure, I stand to be corrected, but we participated when African countries did not have their own pavilions. But then South Africa was isolated because of the apartheid regime internationally. And I think we rejoined um, the Venice Biennale in 1993. We were just trying to debate the date, the exact year. Is it 1993? 
it's not um, so there, there's there's some significance to that, mainly because the question of why Venice, we can only answer and make sense of it locally. For us, is because the because of the racial inequality that's lasted for so long, it's significant for us as two black curators and academics to have this presence, and I think we're the first. And it's terrible to actually, con you know, this thing of being the first first, but I think it is significant to say that it was important for us to, to do particularly the Venice Biennale. It could have been anywhere. And then the other thing that I think is important to note about our participation this year is that we wanted to focus not on, only on the overemphasized relationship between Europe and Africa, but the relationship between African countries. And so the, the transnational pan-African um, context, I think, has to now be the one that's emphasized over this Europe-Africa relationship. So our pavilion uh, is titled The Stronger We Become, and it focuses on social re resilience precisely because of that, and because of that global history that we've had. I mean, if you think about the apartheid movement, we needed an international, we needed an international movement to fight it. We needed other African countries to fight it. And so with the pavilion, we, we emphasizing some of those issues around displacement. And I think some of the issues, I mean, you mentioned fault lines, I was smiling because I think that Jelani Tawadros exhibition was really brilliant in emphasizing the political geography um, of our struggles. And so, so the, 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 the question of social resilience comes on the back of social resistance as well. And so with the three artists that we've selected, Dineo Seshe Bobabe, Tracy Rose and Mawande Gazenzile. We really hope to um, incite a number of dialogues surrounding the various issues that we're currently facing today and also what these borders mean, um, even in our own continent. Hello everybody, my name is uh, Amina Zubir and when I discovered Venice in 2011, it was uh, clearly a shock for me. Why Venice? Venice for me was um, the first biennial where I uh, really understood that there is no hierarchy in art field and it means that aesthetics came from everywhere and it was for me a uh, revelation when I discovered the city, when I discovered also the biennial, visiting different openings about national pavilions collateral events. So in 2011, I decided to orchestrate a kind of a performance where I had to ask all Venetian to um, help me to search for the Algerian pavilion. And I did this performance at, on each um, edition on, uh, two th from 2011, 2013. Here is the picture where we can clearly see the, the sculpture of Martin Keane at the island of San Giorgio. Major just behind me uh, in 2013 on the 3rd of June. And uh, I also did this uh, the same performance on 2000, uh, 2015 and 2017. Um, Venice is one of the oldest uh, Bayana in the world. I think it was created in 1895. And uh, it was really interesting for me to um, visit the Bayana and different openings of, about all this exhibition and to see that th there is new, different aesthetics uh, that uh, you can uh, clearly see and share, uh, discover like different artists from all around the world, but not f a lot from Africa. So um, it's interesting for me to, uh, to, to, to see that uh, when I had my, educa my artistic education in Algeria, it was clearly uh, an, an academic, um, uh, an, an academic uh, le le I mean knowledge that I had and inherited from the legacy of the colonial French uh, artistic uh, education. So I was uh, graduated at the Fine Arts School of Algiers and uh, I grew up during a civil war. Um, when I started to study in this school, the director was murdered on the 5th of March 1994 with his son. Uh, we faced a civil war because uh, I think 
uh, it was clearly also, um, I think, the legacy of the, the, the post-colonial process when you have um, a real crisis of identity and when you, when you have like a di different way to think about ideologies that can really apply on, on social and political backgrounds in a country. Uh, why Venice for me was important to, to, um, uh, to present a work uh, not just by a performance, but I want to also to, uh, through my commitment, to uh, gather and to connect both of authorities, I mean, in the, here in the Venice Biennale and in the Ministry of Culture in Algeria, to settle a, a pavilion, um, a national pavilion of Algeria here in Venice, which was cancelled on 4th April with the new ministry, because uh, you know that actually each Friday there is a, a massive uh, demonstration all around the cities uh, of Algeria, uh, because uh, the new generation are connecting through what is happening in the global uh, and uh, there is, of course, a connection between the local and the global and the new generation are aware about what is happening all around the world and they decided to demand for a democratic and, uh, and like an evolution of the political process. So through, I mean, the result and uh, the, the, the result of all the consequence of all these demonstration was a positive uh, issue. So the president resigned and now we have a new government which uh, cares about the transition. But unfortunately for the Algerian pavilion, the new Ministry of Culture decided to cancel the pavilion through um, um, the, the reason was organizational problems. But um, I think we we printed invitation. We sent uh, we printed our catalogs. Uh, we made like a, a huge work, and the decision of the new minister was clearly, um, I mean, a kind of disregard about all the work that we had, uh, that all the work that we have done. And uh, finally, uh, the artists of the pavilion decided to maintain the exhibition. So we are in Venice to represent our country and to honor Algeria in Venice. But um, it's also beyond our personalities. I'm not here just because um, my name is Amina Zubir. I mean, I'm here also to say that North Africa should be also considered as a country in, in, in Africa. And also we should consider that this is important to consider us, I mean. Uh, well, I, I think that whole issue of you know geographic representation, yes. specificity, and how often the political fault lines, as it were, um, oft, often kind of override those yeah. of, of uh, let's say, the artist's ambitions or intentions. I mean, in relation to Mauro Pinto, oh. who I neglected to organize, I mean, you're Thank representing. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, <laughs> Mozambique. Um, and I think, Mara, you could probably speak also about this question of the kind of the Virgin Pavilion, what it means to be here, presumably for the first time. Um. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's not the first time of the, our pavilion. It's the uh, second uh, time. The first time, I think they, they, di they didn't went to, uh, well. But uh, now we have uh, 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 our national pavilion uh, with uh, Gonzalo Woods. Gonzalo Woods participated with uh, the, um, in 2015, uh, but not in our pavilion. There was uh, the Arsenal. You know? So for us, I think uh, for Mozambique, it's a real. Um, important to have uh, our pavilion in uh, this BNL because we are really far from the uh, connected with the other uh, countries you know? so this platform for, for us is going to be uh, is some door for uh, our country with other countries too to connect it uh, with uh, other uh, art artists and uh, other gallery and uh, other platform of the, the art. I think uh, uh, that is it. I, I, I think I want to invite people to come to visit us at our pavilion. Thank you, Mara.
Well, I think, you know, Joelle pointed out, and I think it's a really important point about uh, deserving Venice or this idea that, you know, the space that's being claimed by national pavilions is somehow the right of uh, the participating country. I think that in a way what, what kind of that sort of logic brings forward is that there's an I think often an issue in terms of how Venice as a kind of, um, uh, let's say, a, a kind of a, a geopolitical event kind of mirrors the state of the world in lots of ways. So it becomes a kind of microcosm for several other forms of, for, let's say, tension. Um, and what I want to ask you all, because in fact, one of the kind of uh, continuations that ran through all of your uh, speeches um, was this idea of how the political often becomes a barrier for art, or in fact, in some ways, becomes a kind of generative force. But I want to start by what were the kind of biggest, I want to end with, what was the biggest obstacle that you faced in creating a pavilion or bringing the pavilion back to Venice? Um, and if so, could you outline, you know, very specifically what that, what that hurdle or barrier was? But starting with Martin and moving up to Mauro, then we'll open out to questions. Actually, uh to be honest, we, we had a reasonably smooth ride. Um, when we first came in 2015, it was necessary to raise sponsorship and the exhibition was put up by uh, an NGO, the Seychelles Arts Project Foundation, which was specifically set up to deliver an exhibition at Pavilion in Venice for the first time for Seychelles. And then the rules changed and so from 2017 onwards, um, it has been the government of Seychelles uh, which has um, enabled the pavilion to be realized, and that is the case this year as well. So uh, we, by we, I mean the commissioner, Galen Bresson, who's standing at the back of the room, um, the artists, our administrator, Ilaria Izolo, who is also here today. Uh, we formed a team, which I think uh, went pretty smoothly. Um, I can't actually identify anything which was a major, major problem. We also uh, benefit for the third time from the support from the European um, Cultural Center and René Rittmeyer. Uh, he has a great love for Seychelles and he has helped us now three times to realize our shows here. So we're a bit spoilt perhaps, we're a bit lucky. Um, I'm sure other, other people on the panel will have uh, uh, more to say on this. It's complex. <laughs> it's a complex thing, you know, because uh, a country like Madagascar is really sophisticated and it's really complex but when we when we we have this this idea to be here we 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 know that we are we are be alone somewhere to 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 fight to 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 rise found to 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 try convincing everybody but we, like you, you saw Joel. Joel is a talented artist, a good communicator, but we deserve to be here. So with him, with friends, with sponsors, with a lot of people, we, we tried to, to do this project. And, uh, and uh, when, I, when I said we deserve it, because we, 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 we faith in, in this project, in, in Joel poetry, so I think it was the, the challenge to 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 bring here the, the the poetry of Joel because you have a pavilion because you have an artist. So we believe in artists, you believe in his project, and it's it's really the challenge after bureaucracy uh, relation with country. It's 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 just nothing for me. It's, uh, we, we believe in someone and believe in his, his poetry and believe in, in, in his work, so it's, it's enough for us to, 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 to go together till Venice. <laughs> Great. So our biggest uh, challenge was time. Uh, we only found out that our proposal was accepted on Valentine's Day, so it was very romantic uh, of the department to send us this email on Valentine's. And uh, <laughs> so we just accepted it and uh, decided to run along and make it happen. So we've been running since uh, February and uh, here we are. And uh, we will open, so. <laughs>
that's about it, really. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, o over, over and above the issue of time, Ruben, what's that? To give gave us what two months to put it all together. Um, is that often there's sort of conflicting agendas, the agenda of the curator and the agenda and the national agenda are not always the same. And, and tomorrow we vote. Tomorrow is the elections in South Africa. And so you can imagine, you know, the pavilion had to move this way, but it's forced that way. <laughs> so I think that's always the, 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 I think it's a main challenge is that sometimes because it's based on this sort of government I and mean, we're facing in, in the post-colonial neoliberal space this sort of need to create these things as services that can be delivered. And for us, it's actually about realizing the ideas and the concepts and, you know, it's, it's completely different conflicting agendas. And so I think that's one of the major challenges we faced. Wow, the challenge was so um, unexpected uh, because we had a, an official national Algerian pavilion and then it was cancelled um, due to the political instability uh, and uh, the uh, population demonstration each Friday. Um, this project, uh, I have probably to, to say and to declare that we are only artists and uh, the, the political and social and aesthetic stakes that we uh, manage through uh, the, the project uh, Time to Shine Bright, which is the ex title of the exhibition of the um, Algerian Pavilion, was uh, a proposal of uh, Hilal Mahmoud Zubir, um, and this, uh, I mean, proposal was was done to the Ministry of Culture uh, last June 2018, and the process took many months until it was validated by the Ministry of Culture, and then it was like a, a long process also with the Bayana. So we started to work from February. Uh, and it um, it was interesting to see how uh, the artists respond to uh, the concept and the curatorial statement is online on the eFlux platform. And uh, why the time to shine bright? Because uh, Algeria had been so long absent from the international event. Uh, well, it's, to, inter it's uh, interesting also that your biggest hurdle, you know, you had time on your side, in fact, a counter to what you were saying before, um, but in fact, due to unexpected circumstances, and I think that those circumstances in Venice often become apparent, particularly around this idea of what the expectations of the commissioners and the curators might be versus the agenda of the political powers, you know, at play. But I'm curious to know, Mauro, if, if there were at all, or were you one of the pavilions that, like Martin, had a kind of seamless transition? Uh, sorry, I didn't get this. So the, about the, the challenges, or the, one challenge that you faced as a pavilion. Uh, <laughs> too many? Too many, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I will maybe get uh, um, the, the other question you make the, to, um, to us is about how our government uh, can um, support I think uh, for us in Mozambique, uh, it's really uh, difficult to deal with uh, the government because um, the they the, the money for the um, for us is the, we don't get this money to to art. So now to be here, I can say. We are here because we have real great support of ACA, who make us to be here. Let's say because the government in Mozambique, I, I know, or not only in Mozambique, some other countries too, they have this problem with uh, um, art. So, but one of the the secretary of the, 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 the Minister of the Culture and the Tourism in Mozambique, they say, yes, you are there, so we need to give the, okay, the letter 
to you. We, we can give the letter to, to you, but we don't have money to put and uh, to, to you to be, to, to be in the pavilion. As we say with uh, Aka, uh, I, I want to say again, thank you to Aka and uh, to help us. Aka. Aka project, yes. Aka project is the 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 the, the help us to to be here. Is one of the curator of the the, the, the our pavilion. It's uh, uh, Lydia Kachature. So I think for us in Africa, we need to build other platform to get uh, more involved first. In the African, like uh, um, uh, the investments in the African, then of course outside too. But uh, I'm really happy to be here with the, uh, our pavilion because we can share our artworks. Of course, we share with the other gallery and the, uh, outside. But I want to say thank you to invite us again. Thank you so much. Maybe there's one question actually I'd like to ask. Um, you know, you have been involved with the South Africa Pavilion, particularly for this reason that the, the previous editions that have gone by, there's been a question around what constitutes an official representation of South African artists, and with there being a actually relatively recent um, set of political concerns, particularly around these questions of what what constitutes yeah a national representation that somehow fits the country's political agenda, maybe you, maybe you could just outline why you chose these specific artists or whether there was a choosing process. Um, because I think what many of you are going to find with the South Africa Pavilion is it's one of the most, I think, strange and, and intriguing combinations of three artists that might not have been shown together otherwise. Um, so, I mean, you know, Amongst those artists, Tracy Rose has been at the Venice Biennale before. Um, do you know her as well? Do you know, you know? the Future Art Prize? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's artists who have sort of become very visible globally, but not, but in South Africa, somewhat marginalized. Um, and f for us, the selection wasn't so much in trying to get a broad representation of South African art or the South African art scene, but in selecting artists and artworks that enable us to articulate the sense of disenchantment that South Africans are feeling right now. And, um, and the artists who could do that in such a raw way, I, I mean, you know, if you know Tracy Rose's work and Danielle Sashaba Babe, it's such, and even Mawande, it's such raw ways of working with affect, with, uh, um, with the, um, you know, when they, the way they work with materials as well. So I think it, it really was, and, and it's artists that we've, in our collaborative curatorial projects, we've worked with. So we've been following their work and they formulate part of that broader intellectual process. Um, so it wasn't really about us trying to capture the national, you know, represent the national scene in terms of what's happening in South Africa, but really just to capture the moment, uh, especially because we've been having so many protests, uh, protests by young people, and it was that sense of disenchantment with the post-apartheid era that we felt needed to be said, and be said in such raw and unapologetic ways. Yeah, and so then what you encounter in the space is more, as, um, I think what we want you to get out of it is more of a feeling. So you're supposed to kind of uh, encounter the works of Mawande, see the questions that he poses, create this reflective moment for yourself as well, and then in the background you're hearing the sound of, uh, from Tracy's work, um, as you navigate around Daniela's sculpture, so it's a whole kind of moment. Um, it's not, so it wasn't just about, oh, we are creating, these are the different positions and this is where they are as individuals, but it's more about, 
um, the connectedness and what they're all saying and then how the person encountering this moment then um, feels or perhaps becomes conscientized about something or transformed in some kind of emotional, emotive way. Um, because their works are quite heavy and are quite um, intellectual as well because they're um, the questions that they pose and the, the, the things that they, they try to articulate with the work. And also a lot of it requires uh, the person experiencing the work to bring a lot of themselves into it. Um, yeah, we're all really excited to see it. Thank you all so much. And afterwards, uh, we're going to present the film of uh, George Adiagbo, who was mentioned earlier, one of actually the first artists of African descent to, to show here in the Biennale among... Um, among the pavilions, so I think that um, that's hopefully ready.